I'm Nancy Scott, the president of the League of Women Voters of Northern Nevada, and we are proud to host the third in our series of election forums, along with our partners, AAUW and Sierra Nevada Forums. These forums would not be possible without the generous support also of the Nevada Appeal and the Brewery Arts Center. In addition, we sincerely thank the candidates and the representatives for being here tonight to answer questions and inform our community. So before we begin, please make sure your electronic devices are muted and please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political action network. It was formed in 1920 to encourage the active and informed participation of citizens in government and to influence public policy through education and advocacy. We have a long tradition of thorough research into many subjects, including health care, equity, government, accountability, the environment, as well as forums like this, featuring candidates for elected office and issues that are of critical importance to our community. The League of Women Voters' overarching goal is making democracy work. There's nothing more important to this goal than having informed voters. That is the purpose of our voter forums. Misinformation and disinformation may be presented as fact during tonight's discussions. It is up to each voter to sort out fact from misinformation. Tonight's forum is divided into three segments. First, State Senate District 16, then State Assembly District 40, and finally, State Assembly District 39. The format is as follows. Each candidate will have a two-minute opening statement, followed by questions and answers. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question and 30 seconds for a rebuttal. And then each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. Volunteers in the aisles will collect your questions we request that your submitted questions be applicable to all participating candidates. Please write one question per index card. Volunteers at this table will collect the cards and screen them to avoid duplicated questions. In the interest of adhering to our tight schedule, we ask that you refrain from applause until the end of each part. Our moderator tonight is Heather Bowles, and we will begin. Thank you so much. I would like to introduce for Senate District 16 candidates, or excuse me, Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner and candidate Aaron Sims. Thank you so much for being here. Each candidate will get two minutes per question, and after that, there is time for a 30 second rebuttal. I just want to note that Assemblywoman Krasner can only be here for half an hour, 30 minutes. At this time, Assembly Krasner will give her opening statement. Thank you. Hello, I am Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner, and I have had the honor of serving as the State Assemblywoman for Nevada State Assembly District 26 for the last six years. I was first elected in 2016. Uh, my educational background consists of a bachelor's degree from UCLA 
and a doctorate degree in law from the University of Laverne College of Law. Uh, when I am not serving as your assemblywoman, I teach at the college. I teach in the political science department at Truckee Meadows Community College, and I teach courses on the United States Constitution and Nevada Constitution. Prior to that, I taught at the University of Phoenix, where I taught courses also on the United States Constitution, state and local political processes, advocacy and mediation, critical thinking, and business law to the MBA students. Um, my endorsements include uh, the State of Nevada Realtors Association, Nevada Recovery PAC, um, the Nevada Contractors Association, I'm endorsed by the NRA as well as A-rated, endorsed by Nevada Firearms Co Coalition as well as A-rated, uh, every law enforcement agency in the state of Nevada, the Professional F Firefighters Association of Nevada, um, Nevada Veterans Association, State of Nevada Republican Party, the Public Safety Alliance, let me see what else. Henderson Chamber of Commerce, Keystone Corporation, Veterans in Politics International, Nevada State Medical Association, the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce, uh, and various other organizations, but those are the highlights. Um, I think that's it for now, so I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims. All right, well, first and foremost, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting uh, tonight's debate, as well as the Brewery Arts Center. This is a wonderful facility, and I'm privileged to be here. I do want to thank Heather for moderating, as well as Assemblywoman Krasner for agreeing to participate tonight. My name is Aaron Sims, and I am honored to be the Democratic nominee for State Senate for District 16. I got into this race because I believe in lifting up working class and average everyday Nevadan people. That's what I think should be at the heart of any public servant who serves in public life. I have a little bit of a different background than the Assemblywoman. I was originally born and raised down in the Central Valley of California. I did move up here when I was 11 with my family, graduated from Douglas High School, attended Western Nevada College. I've spent uh, a number of years working through hospitality, retail, and the service industry. And for the past several years, I've worked within overall finance in accounting, bookkeeping, and auditing. I've also worked with various uh, outreach organizations, community-based organizations, as well as spent nearly between 15 and 20 years being an activist in politics. And I've also been on both sides of the aisle, so I understand, you know, uh, both sides. <laughs> So I have, been, I have been endorsed myself by the AFL-CIO, by the Northern Nevada Central Labor Council, by the Sierra Club, uh, Toyabi chapter, by the Nevada Democratic Party, by the uh, Rural Nevada Democratic uh, Caucus, by Building and Trades, and by a few other you know, working class organizations, because that's why I'm here and that's what I believe in. Again, I, wanna appreci I appreciate everybody for being here this evening and for listening to us. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to answer some questions. Thank you so much. The first question will go to Candidate Sims. Candidate Sims, do you accept the results of the 2020 presidential election as legitimate? Yes. What measures do you believe are necessary to ensure fair, accurate elections and equal voting access? So for the first part of that question, I believe we're here, here in Nevada, we honestly are ranked as one of the highest when it comes to our security in elections in the country. We are a very secure state when it comes to our elections. There's no doubt about that. The actual facts and statistics show us this. When it comes to ensuring that we have ease of access for voting, well, there's a lot of things that we can do. First and foremost, we have already ensured that we are working on mail-in ballots, which I know is a controversial thing for some folks. Our Secretary of State's office, as well as our local municipalities and the county clerk's office, have been working since 2020, including this primary election for 2022, as well as the November election in 2020, on ensuring that those ballots are counted fairly and safely. What we do need to do is we need to expand access even more so to our rural communities. And of course, Senate District 16 
does cover a good portion of our rural communities. And we can do that by ensuring that we have more areas where people can go and vote. We can do that by ensuring that folks who are disabled, folks who are not able to go to the polls, can and will get uh, either a mail-in ballot or an early, you know, some form of, of early voting, because that's crucial. We need to ensure that everyone who is a Nevadan and who is able to vote can vote, and that's more important today than ever before. Assemblywoman Krasner, would yes. you like me to repeat the question? Please. Do you accept the results of the 2020 presidential election as legitimate? Yes. What measures do you believe are necessary to ensure fair, accurate elections and equal voting access? Well, I think that we have come a long way when we talk about uh, equal access to voting. I, as I stated earlier, I teach courses at the College on the United States Constitution and Nevada Constitution, and I'm going over with my students right now a chapter on how African Americans previously did not have ease of access to voting because of things like Jim Crow laws or poll taxes or literacy tests, which I'm opposed to. I think every citizen should have ease of access to voting in our elections, and I strongly encourage that. Uh, that being said, as I walk door to door and talk to people, and I'm talking to not just Republicans, I'm talking to nonpartisans, independents, Democrats as well, people do tell me that they have some concerns with election practices. One of those would be ballot harvesting. Ballot harvesting, which was passed in the 2021 session, uh, or during the special session, excuse me, uh, was a felony the day before it was legal. It was a felony in the state of Nevada. So I'm opposed to ballot harvesting and most of the people I'm talking to are as well. Uh, another issue that people are concerned with is the fact that mail-in ballots can be received for five days after the election. People feel that five days is too long. I ask them, well, what would you consider appropriate so that those ballots can come in and have uh, go through the mail process. They said maybe 48 hours, two days, um, but not five days. It, it concerns people, five days after an election. Uh, another person, uh, it was actually a woman who was a Democrat, uh, a senior citizen. She told me she used to work in a law firm and they had a, something called a Pitney Bowes postage machine. And when you open it, you can alter the date. Assemblywoman Krasner. How do we know people aren't all Your time is dates? up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sims, would you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal? Would you like to take that? Um, yes, I would. I think that five days is accurate. I think that that makes sense when it comes to sending out our mail-in ballots. I understand the concerns that folks have, and I, I do. I've heard the same exact thing when I go door to door. I've heard the same exact thing when I talk to certain nonpartisans and even uh, other Republicans. The difference in three days, it helps, especially right now, since this is so new for the state of Nevada. Um, obviously, we haven't had mail-in ballots prior to the 2020 election. It helps all of our county clerk's office, offices ensure that all of our ballots are counted accurately and properly, and it ensures that people can submit them on a timely manner. Thank you so much. Assemblywoman Krasner, this question is for you. What do you perceive to be the greatest fiscal challenge for Nevada in the immediate future, and how would you address it? Well, I think the greatest fiscal challenge is also the number one issue in our state, and that's the economy. The economy and job creation are both very important issues for Nevada as a whole and for Nevada residents. Right now, as I walk door to door, people are constantly telling me, Lisa, the cost of living is through the roof. I'm paying $6.10 for one gallon of gas. I can't even afford to fill up my car because it's $80. Uh, other people have said, Lisa, I'm paying $7 for a gallon of milk. I can barely afford to buy the necessities. Uh, I've spoken to senior citizens who said, Lisa, I worked hard my whole life. I've planned for my retirement. But now, with the inflation and the economy, I don't know if I have enough money to afford to live on what I plan for for my retirement. 
So I think the economy and inflation are big issues. Also, creating good paying jobs for people so that I'm a mom. Uh, when our kids grow up, I don't want them to have to move to another state to get a good paying job. I want them to be able to stay right here in Nevada and have a good paying job. And I think we all want that for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims, would you like me to repeat the question? Oh, no. Um, I, I would tend to agree with the Assemblywoman on this particular issue, that it is the economy. But more specifically, uh, what's going to cost us a lot is ensuring that the next time that we run into a situation or an emergency, such as a pandemic or uh, any kind of state emergency, it could be with weather, climate change, et cetera, uh, that we're better prepared for it. Because right now, we as a state, we have not been prepared for these sorts of situations. And with that would come expanding uh, our revenue and, and making sure that we have proper sources of revenue for the state. I think that we can make Nevada more prepared in the future. But I agree, cost of living is through the roof. I only earn about $42,000 a year. So I understand what it's like to struggle under the current situations that we're dealing with. Unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is out of our control. But what is within our control is ensuring that people have, again, good paying jobs. I definitely agree with that. Ensuring that folks have affordable housing to where we're seeing second, third, fourth generation Nevadans being kicked out of their own homes because they can't afford housing. So we need to ensure that we have affordable housing here in Nevada. We also need to ensure that we are setting not just our children, but even some adults, their futures, um, making sure that they're successful. And by that, we have to invest a good amount of our own money into education. And then, of course, finally, health care. That's another big thing. As we move towards a future where we want uh, to see a healthier, happier society, we really need to focus more on our health care system here in the state of Nevada. So all of these things wrapped into one, in the overall economy, that's a very important thing. But all of those issues are ones that are going to cost the state quite a bit of money in the upcoming years. But we need to start building that and working towards that now so that we can be better prepared in the future. Thank you. Assemblywoman Krasner, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you. I thought that the question said what single issue uh, was the top priority. And I did say the economy and job creation. But since we're talking about other issues that I feel are important, obviously education is a huge issue. Uh, that's something that comes up constantly as I walk door to door with all parties. People want to have choices for their children as far as education goes. That's why I'm in favor of school choice. Whether it's a public school, a private school, a charter school, homeschooling, online schools, kids aren't one size fits all. And parents should be able to choose what's Assembly best for their child. Your time is up. Thank you. Candidate Sims. The effects of climate change are already evident in our region. With huge wildfires, smoke, drought, extreme heat events, and more. What policy or legislation would you support to help minimize Nevada's CO2 emissions? And how would you help our communities to adapt to climate change? Sure. So the federal government has already been working to reduce CO2 and carbon emissions by reducing our uh, dependency on coal. I think that that is something that here in the state of Nevada we need to follow suit with. Um, we can also work together to find more creative alternative solutions for curbing CO2 emissions. That means investment in things like public transportation here in the state of Nevada, especially in northern Nevada, where it's lacking quite a bit in our rural communities, as well as in places like Reno and Sparks. That would, in the long run, curb a lot of CO2 emissions because folks are not going to be driving as much. We also should focus on those factories and companies within the state of Nevada that do a lot, you know, they, they cause a lot of the pollution and carbon emissions. And I'm so sorry, can you remind me what the second part of your question was? Yes. How would you help our communities to adapt to climate change? Sure. Um, well, there's a lot of different th ways that we can do that. Number one, we have to get serious about where we're building our 
our developments and our homes and things like that. One of the ways that we can help uh, avoid natural disasters is by not building in sprawling, you know, in different, in different communities. Uh, don't build in floodplains, things like that. I think we need to have smart, sustainable growth. I also want to add on to this, part of the plans that I would support when it comes to overall climate change is I want to partner with the state of California to create a new forest policy that will reduce the amount of dry kindling and brush in our forests so we can have proper forest management. That would reduce the amount of fires that we get every year and you know that it's been going getting out of control which means we're also reducing the amount of ash that exists in Lake Tahoe which has been getting dirtier and dirtier for the last number of years. Candidate Sims your time is up. Thank you. Assemblywoman Krasner you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Could you repeat the question please? Absolutely. The effects of climate change are already evident in our region with huge wildfires, smoke, droughts, extreme heat events, and more. What policies or legislation would you support to help minimize Nevada's CO2 emissions, and how would you help our communities to adapt to climate change? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Oh, I apologize for that. That's fine. <laughs> um, I agree that the federal government has already implemented many policies regarding climate change, CO2 emissions, conservation. Uh, obviously, we all care about our state. We all want clean water to drink. We all want clean air to breathe. Uh, we all want to make sure that we have uh, beautiful landmarks like Lake Tahoe for not just us to enjoy, but our children and grandchildren yeah. to enjoy in the future. Uh, that being said, I would be in favor of any reasonable legislation uh, that is not too far reaching, that uh, improves our community. Um, I do agree that public transportation would be um, something that would help out with reducing CO2 emissions. Um, people should have a choice if they don't want to drive their car. Uh, I think public transportation is a great option. I think bike lanes uh, are a great option for people who want to bike to work. I think carpooling is a great option for people who want to carpool. Maybe we could have a carpool lane here in Nevada to encourage that kind of behavior where People don't get caught up in the gridlock. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Now it's time for 30 seconds. Candidate Sims, 30 seconds for rebuttal. Um, I don't have one at this time. Okay. Thank you so much. Assemblywoman Krasner, how would you increase the availability of quality, affordable housing? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, during the 2021 legislative session, I was the sponsor of AB 333, which is now the law. Uh, previously, there was a law in the books that said that if there was any water that had puddled up on cement, the builders had to stop building. All the construction guys and gals that were there working had to stop working and go home. Uh, I thought that was absolutely egregious, so I created a law uh, which passed with bipartisan support and was signed into law by Governor Sisolak that basically said that that water that's pooled up can be diverted so that the builders can go on building, that the men and women that are there building the houses can get back to work and don't have to lose a day or a week's pay. Uh, so I've, I've already done something that... Uh, helps to create affordable housing by allowing people to get back to work and allowing builders to build. Uh, additionally, I think affordable housing is incredibly important. When I talk to my students about uh, the American dream, they tell me, we don't know if we'll be able to achieve the American dream, Professor Krasner, because it's so expensive right now to buy a house, even if I'm working and my partner's working, I don't know if we can afford to save up the money so that we can buy a house someday. So I think affordable housing is incredibly important. Uh, 
having affordable apartments is important, but also condominiums, uh, which are like the first step for most people after renting, but before home ownership. I think it's important that everybody gets to enjoy the pride of ownership of a home, and, and I think everyone wants to have a roof over their head. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Kendit Sims, would you like me to repeat the question? Oh, no, thank you. Um, I want to be clear. We're in a housing crisis right now. Far too many Nevadans cannot afford to live where they're living. They're being pushed out of their homes. They're having to relocate to different states, finding better work, finding better opportunities. It's very much a crisis. And this was a crisis, by the way, that started not just because of the pandemic, but it started uh, probably several years ago where we started seeing a lot of housing costs go through the roof. So when, it, when we're talking about affordable housing, there's a lot of things that we need to do and what we need to work on. Uh, first of all, of course, I'm a huge proponent of building real, actual affordable housing in our areas. I also am a big proponent of uh, housing integration. I think that that's an important thing that we need to look at. We need to really have all options available to us on the table when it comes to dealing with this crisis. Because it's not just about folks who have come here recently from other states. It's about keeping first, second, third generation Nevadans in their homes so they could be part of our society and our communities. I also do believe that um, when we're talking about creating affordable housing, it's important that we understand that there are different ways that builders and developers um, follow after their, uh, their rules, so to speak. My apologies, I can't come up with the correct term. But um, real affordable housing would mean that we need to do that as a percentage for what folks can afford here in Nevada rather than following the federal mandates, which oftentimes could be a little bit more expensive because they tend to agree to you know, push it up to the max. So we need to have real affordable housing, and that needs to exist in all of our communities. Thank you. Assemblywoman Krasner, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sims, how do you propose we increase access to high quality health care and recruit and retain health care professionals, especially in our rural areas? Sure. So the only way that we can actually increase access is by ensuring that all Nevadans are insured. That's really what it comes down to. We also need to consider building more hospitals and more clinics in different areas, including rural areas. Um, one of the ways that we can do that, and I know the state of Nevada has been working on this over the last couple of years, is we can expand our public option or the health, Nevada Health Exchange uh, and ensuring that more people are actually insured. I believe fervently that expansion of access to health care also needs to include, first and foremost, mental health. Because mental health has been lacking for so long here in Nevada. We've cut and cut and cut when it comes to mental health access and clinics. And we really need to, to prioritize that as a funding base. Thank you so much. Assemblywoman Krasner, would you like me to repeat the question? Please. How do you propose we increase access to high quality health care and recruit and retain health care professionals, especially in our rural areas? Okay. Thank you. Access to quality health care is something that's important to every person. Uh, it's something that I feel very strongly about as well, but it's not just access to health care, it's access to quality health care. Nevada has a huge shortage of doctors. The United States has a shortage of doctors, but Nevada is uh, one of the worst in our shortage of doctors, our shortage of nurses, our shortage of mental health care providers, our shortage of mental health uh, and behavioral health hospitals. Uh, sadly, the Medicaid reimbursement rate in the state of Nevada has not been increased in nearly 20 years, which is far too long. Um, it, it's, hard to, it's hard for 
a doctor who, I, I spoke to a doctor who was, he was in private practice, he was an internal medicine doctor, he always accepted patients who uh, were Medicaid and Medicare. He told me, Lisa, I have to close my business because I can't afford to pay my staff and keep the lights on because the Medicaid reimbursement rate is so low that the very people I want to help, I can't help because I can't afford to even keep my doors open. That's ridiculous. Uh, and that's something that the legislature can do. The legislature can increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate in the state of Nevada. So I'm hugely in favor of that, as well as we need to attract uh, more doctors, more nurses, and more mental health care providers. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. So one of the ways that we can actually attract more nurses and healthcare uh, professionals, doctors, et cetera, is by offering more competitive pay and by ensuring that each of our hospitals are doing just that. And if that takes the state of Nevada to come in and you know supplement some of that, then we're gonna have to do that. That is a long-term investment that makes sense for the people of Nevada. And that also follows by expanding where our hospitals and our clinics are located. And there's too many areas in rural Nevada where they're lacking. Candidate Sims, time. Thank you. Assemblywoman Krasner, would you support legislation that limits reproductive rights? Explain your position. I'm not sure what the question is. Would you support legislation that limits reproductive rights? Oh, and excuse me, please explain your position. Limits reproductive rights? Would you support legislation <laughs> that limits reproductive rights? So are you talking about how many children somebody can have, like in China? No, uh, in Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> that, is that your answer to my question? I'm sorry, Assemblywoman. I, can could you, you clarify the question? Um, what is your position on abortion rights? Oh, uh, well, here in the state of Nevada, um, the law regarding abortion is firmly ingrained. It was ingrained by a ballot initiative of the people and cannot be changed by the Nevada State Legislature. So if you're asking about my personal opinion, I am pro-life with exceptions for rape, exceptions for incest, and exceptions for life, health, and safety of the mother. I also believe in ease of access to contraception for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims. Would you support legislation that limits reproductive rights? Please explain your position. No. Um, and the reason why is because when it comes to reproductive rights or reproductive health for women and anyone else who has a uterus, that is a decision between themselves and their doctors. So no, I will not support any kind of pieces of legislation that limits that. Uh, that makes no sense to me. Um, that's a medical decision between, again, the patient and the doctor. Thank you, Candidate Sims. Assemblywoman Krasner, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. I don't have a rebuttal at this time, thank you. Thank you. At this time, to honor time, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Candidate Sims, what will you do to address the lack of childcare? So the lack of child care in this state has been, um, again, it's, it's something else that's been very troubling for a lot of working class moms and working class parents. One of the things that we can do in the state of Nevada is we, co we can uh, provide access to proper good child care. I think that that's something that should be part of our expanding Nevada Health Exchange, but as well as partnering and giving incentives to uh, private hospitals and clinics, or I'm so sorry, um, private entities that are working with child care. So different schools, uh, different folks who are, uh, you know, able to watch kids and, and uh, 
and you know, provide access. So I do think that that's something that the state could partner with when it comes to these private entities. Thank you, candidate Sims. Assemblywoman Krasner, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. What will you do to address the lack of childcare? Uh, so I do believe that lack of childcare is a problem for working class families as well as single mothers who are trying to provide for their children and work at the same time. And I think it's incredibly important that we do have adequate childcare for those people, for those working class people. Uh, we wanna encourage people to work and not go on the welfare system, obviously. So um, maybe we could have uh, government tax credits for people who wanna open childcare facilities. I read an article recently that said that we have very few child care facilities even open and available right now that are accepting children here in Nevada because during the pandemic so many small businesses were forced to close. Um, the other thing I've heard from uh, these uh, owners of these child care facilities is that there's excessive and burdensome regulations on the facilities. Excessive and burdensome regulations on any business kills the business. So we could probably ease up on the burdensome regulations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Yeah, my only rebuttal for that would be that those regulations are put in place to ensure that there's protection for those kids as well as those child care workers. So I wouldn't support, uh, you know, taking away those kinds of regulations that ensures that there's, you know, protection available. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for my rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. How many more questions do we have? Do you want to make some more? There's quite a few. Um, how many do you want to do? Um, how many do you have left? Do you want to finish the six? Yeah, we can do that if you're cool with that. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We wanted to honor uh, Assemblywoman Krasner's time, so we wanted to find a way that was fair and equitable, and both candidates agreed to ask one more audience question, audience submitted question, and we'll get back to the other questions. Thank you again to both. Assemblywoman Krasner, would you support the legislature housing to comply with the open meeting law and the public records law, and why or why not? Uh, yes, I would support um, anybody uh, complying with the open meeting law because the open meeting law is put there for a purpose. It's so that uh, citizens feel that they have access to what's going on in the meetings of their elected officials. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Candidate Sims, would you like me to repeat the question? Um, yes, please. Would you support the legislature having, the, having to comply with the open meeting law and the public records law, and why or why not? Is that pertaining to the legislative session or to different county um, boards or? That is a good question. <laughs> because I would argue that there's, you know, there's a big difference between the. We believe the session. So um, I think there needs to be a little bit more nuance with that. I do agree with the open meeting law as a whole, but because so much has to be done in the state legislature, and I know my opponent would agree with this, um, it, it, it would have to be condensed. We do need to be open and transparent as legislators. We need to be able to talk directly with our constituents. It's one of the many reasons why I'm in this race as well. Um, so yes, I, I would support it very much, but as long as you know, there's, there's a certain base of restrictions that exist as well. Thank you so much. Assemblywoman Krasner, 
You have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. I don't have one at this time, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And as of this time, this is the last of the audience submitted question, as well as a time limit. So we'd like to thank Assemblywoman Krasner. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And at this moment, um, oh, briefly, excuse me, one sec. Once again, thank you so much for your patience. Assemblywoman at this time, excuse me, Assemblywoman Krasner, at this time, if you'd like, you can give your op closing statement one minute of time. Okay. Um, I appreciate being here tonight. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the Nevada Appeal for being here and inviting us to be here. Also, thank you to all the people in the audience that showed up tonight. Thank you for caring so much about your election and your vote. Thank you having an interest in your government. Um, I believe that my experience is what makes me the better candidate. Uh, it's not possible to just walk into the legislature and know what you're doing. I've served for three regular sessions and three special sessions in the Nevada legislature, and I do know what's going on. Each and every session, I have passed high-quality, bipartisan legislation that improves all the people's lives in the state of Nevada and helps people in the state of Nevada. I love Nevada and I care about the people who live here. I have children of my own. Uh, I want them to have a bright future as well as your children and your grandchildren. Some of the many bills that I've passed are bills for child victims of sexual abuse, bills for sexual assault victims, public safety, domestic violence, sex trafficking, human trafficking, education, government accountability and transparency, disabled veterans, Assemblywoman children, Krasner. land use planning, Assemblywoman Holocaust Krasner, and other genocides, your time is up. senior Thank citizens, Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Krasner. People. Thank you so much. Your time is up. I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. And excuse me, at this time, candidate Sims would like to also give his closing statement, one minute. So again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters as well as the Brewery Arts Center and Heather for moderating. And of course, I want to thank Assemblywoman Krasner for agreeing to this forum. I, again, you know, uh, my, my whole purpose for the, running in this race is to stand up for working class, average, everyday Nevadans. I believe it's important in, that we lift everybody up here in the state of Nevada. I am very much interested in being a pragmatic person in the state legislature, and I agree with working on both sides of the aisle. I think that that's very much important. I also believe in having an open door policy, ensuring that, again, if your constituents want to speak to you as a legislature, that's very crucial. I'm going to encourage you to visit my website for more information about my platform and where and my background and what I plan to do for the great state of Nevada. It's simsfornevada.com. And then, of course, you can reach out to me on my cell phone or through email. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you so very much for this evening. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Krasner and Candidate Sims. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, audience, for returning from your break. We will uh, continue our forum tonight. We have Senate District 16, Assembly District, oh, sorry. Sorry, so sorry. <laughs> Assembly District 40 and 39, apologies for that. For District 40, we have candidate Shannon McDaniel. 
and candidates, <laughs> Philip P.K. O'Neill. And for District 39, we have candidate Janice Noble. The candidates have agreed in the ordering of their opening statements, with candidates O'Neill going first, then candidate McDaniel, then candidate Noble. The first to get the question will be candidate McDaniel, followed by candidate O'Neill, then candidate Noble. At this time, candidate O'Neill, excuse me, before candidate O'Neill gives their opening statement, I would also like to explain that candidate Ken Gray was invited but declined the invitation. <laughs> candidate O'Neill, at this time, you may give your opening statement. With Ken not showing up, it's two to one. <clears throat> Good odds. So, anyways, <laughs> thank you, Heather. I want to thank Nancy Scott, President of the League of Women Voters, for sponsoring this candidate's forum and express my appreciation to all of you here with us tonight. I'm the current Assemblyman for District 40 and look forward to earning your vote to continue representing you. I have been serving the state of Nevada for over 40 years, between my 30 years plus in law enforcement and as a two-term assemblyman. Nancy and I have been married for over 25 years. We are empty nesters with four adult children and six grandchildren who, unfortunately, are spread across the country. However, together, we enjoy traveling to visit our children, touring the country, and volunteering with our church and various community organizations. I graduated from Sarah Nevada College with a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management. I retired as a Division Chief at the Nevada Department of Public Safety. Upon my retirement, I began work as a consultant with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the FBI. Additionally, I served four years as a commissioner on the State Ethics Commission. I am on the Carson Tahoe Health Board of Directors and am past chairman of the Salvation Army of Carson City and Douglas County. I believe this is why I'm endorsed by so many of our community leaders, organizations, and businesses. We need policies which promote Nevada as the place to conduct business, raise a family, and enjoy the beauty of our great state. We need to restore Nevada's economy onto a solid foundation, reduce burdensome regulations, improve our medical services, respect our veterans, support our law enforcement, and fix our challenged educational system. Nevada is my home, and you deserve a public servant who is here for you. As Nancy can attest to, I routinely take calls at all hours from constituents with a variety of issues, some asking for help, some just wanting to talk to me. I look forward to the honor of continuing to represent you in the assembly with your support, and I look forward to your questions tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Candidate O'Neill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Candidate McDaniel, you have two minutes for your opening statements. Thank you, Heather. Thank you to everyone involved in putting this forum together, <coughs> including the League of Women Voters, Sierra Nevada Forums, and the AAUW. I am Shannon McDaniel, and I'm running for Assembly District 40. Before I get into who I am, I want to tell you why I'm running. Nevada is the driest state in the nation, averaging a little less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. Take that in for a second. 10 inches of rain a year? What does that look like? It looks like the ever-growing bathtub ring in Lake Mead and the dead fish in 2021 lying on the playa that Little Washoe Lake once filled. Water should be at the top of our conversation every session. So why isn't it? Our legislature has a limited understanding of Nevada water law and of the unintended consequences of the decisions being made. We have laws passed that do not allow some holders of water right permits the ability to drill replacement wells when theirs go down and laws that unintentionally encourage the waste of our limited resource by not providing for conservation. Working at the Nevada Division of Water Resources for over nine years, and now as a licensed water rights surveyor in the private industry, I've become intimately familiar with the water law through the administration of that law, the creation of regulations to support that law, and by helping the citizens of Nevada navigate that law. 
I've been told that I'm a one-issue candidate. I would argue that anyone who runs for public office is called to service by one issue that is close to their heart. I've been in Nevada since I was a baby. I grew up in Dayton. I've worked since I was 13 and put myself through college. I graduated from WNC when it had the extra C with my, associate, with my associates in math and I graduated from UNR with my bachelor's in environmental engineering. I currently hold a license as a professional engineer and as a water rate surveyor. I've not run for public office in the past. However, I'm a hard worker, a good friend, a wife, a stepmom, and a proud member of my community. I love Nevada and care about all the issues that affect my home. And I'm excited and honored to have a chance to represent our district in the State Assembly. Thank, Thank you. you. Candidate McDaniel. Candidate Noble, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. I have no doubt that everyone in this room wants a representative who is honest, accountable, and will work hard for legislation that helps their district and who, is, who supports their rights. Hello, I'm Janice Noble, and I promise to be that representative if you give me the honor of your vote. I want to thank the League of Women Voters, Sierra Nevada Forums, and AAUW, and the Brewery Arts Center for sponsoring this event. I believe in common sense solutions to our problems, like access to health care, both physical and mental. I think protecting resources in rural Nevada from out of control and poorly thought out development is critical. I believe our children deserve the best possible education and that resources must be invested in their future. It is critical for our, to our democracy to protect voting rights. I want to ensure that the persistent lies about fraud are countered and dispelled. If legislation is needed to enforce that, then I will support that legislation. I absolutely will work to protect the rights of all women to control their own reproductive health and to have the bodily autonomy that is their human right. I look forward to working across the aisle to create and support legislation that furthers these points of view. It's a shame that Ken Gray chose to disrespect the voters of District 39 by not attending this forum. He needs to answer the same questions that I will tonight and or be held accountable for dodging them. I am ready to answer your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much to all the candidates. As of this time, I'm just going to take a few moments. I want to clarify, and I don't want to interrupt the flow as the questions are being answered. So please bear with me. Thank you so much. Remind me to ask you about soccer later. I want to know why I reft you. Yeah. Did you play for Dayton High? No, so I actually oh. didn't get into it until I was 24. Oh. My sister played in Dayton High. Oh, I've Which, W-U-T-C-H. Did you read that? Did you read that? Yeah, I read high school, junior college. I read for everything from all the way up. Carson, well, high school was all in the state. Uh, and then also the group based. Thank you so much for your patience. Candidate McDaniel, this question is for you. Do you accept the results of the 2020 president election as legitimate? Yes. Was there more to the question? <laughs> <laughs> there is. Sorry. I told you this was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Candidate McDaniel. What measures do you believe are necessary to ensure fair, accurate elections and equal voting access? Thank you, Heather. So, um, like I said, I, I do not think, um, well, I, yes, I, I think that it was fair. Um, we do some great things in, in Nevada with uh, voter roll maintenance. We have, um, our records are updated by the DMV, death certificates, social security. Um, our, we recently had uh, ballot harvesting passed. Um, 
you, you know, the legislature does allow it. The secret secretary of the state um, isn't super keen on it, but, um, you know, I, I really believe that voting needs to be accessible. Uh, we should not deny people their right to vote. We could tighten up ballot harvesting, though, um, by requiring some type of affidavit or, or requiring some type of certificate for the folks that are, you know, going out and collecting the ballots or, or something like um, how, how many ballots can be transported at one time. Um, but um, I, I think that's, that's it for me for that. Thank you. Thank you, candidate McDaniel. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? No, ma'am, I think I've got it. Yes, and I got elected, why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll also say too, if a person does question the election results, they have every right to proceed with their rights to address them properly. And as to voting per se, regulations, even the Secretary of State admitted that there was some, there were questionable uh, actions, however, they did not amount to large enough to overturn the overall election. What we really need to do is, as my opponent said, we need to tighten some things up. We had several regulations that the Secretary of State asked for before the elections, and they were uh, such things as if a ballot harvester and person was going to collect more or turn in more than 10 votes, they had to register identify themselves. So if there was any question about those ballots, we knew who to go to. Unfortunately, it was not allowed by the Democrats that were in power and, and some of the other regulations. Voter ID, in 42 years, over 42 years I've been here, I've got to admit my signature has changed drastically over the years. Um, I am really amazed how they keep allowing me just to sign, and I look at those original signatures, and I really do question it, but that's it. But I think IDs, there's nothing wrong with it, and I think more people are getting to accept that. We do need to clean up the roles. We need to invest in technology to have a more immediate response when a person dies or death certificate goes into vital stats and then is also relayed over to the Secretary of State to remove from the election rules. We need to do that. We wanted to send out postcards ahead of time to make sure that the person still lived at the address they were at. That was denied. That's a simple action. And it would also save money on those ballots that were wasted. So there are things we can do. But yes, I, it was a good election with some questions, but we can always improve. We should work for improvement. Thank you, candidate O'Neill. Candidate Noble, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, pl yes, please. Do you accept the results of the 2020 presidential election as legitimate? Yes, of course. What measures do you believe are necessary to ensure fair, accurate elections and equal voting access? I'm just gonna say that my opponent has been has stated that voting is not a right. And I am absolutely disagree with that. Voting is a right. We need to um, allow as much access as possible. I am definitely in favor of uh, mail-in ballots. Um, there is a system in place, and a lot of it has already been discussed, but there is a system in place that allows for when there's a signature question that voter is contacted and they have several days, ten, up to 10, I believe, to come in and, and make sure that their signature is the one that is on file. I will also say that the Brennan Center for Justice stated recently that 0.0004% is the fraud level in this country they identify that as simply noise. I also, would t I also would say that voters need to pick their representatives. Representatives should not be picking their voters. So I do not believe redistricting in a way that segregates or suppresses vote is, should be happening. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Noble. 
At this time, we will open up for rebuttals. Candidate McDaniel, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. No, thank you. Good one. We move on to the next question. No. Candidate O'Neill, what do you perceive to be the greatest fiscal challenge for Nevada in the immediate future, future and how would you address it? Boy, that is, two minutes, huh? <clears throat> one issue. Well, as it was previously stated, the economy. Uh, some of that I don't have control over on a state level when you're talking about oil, the inflation side. But what we do, do have control over on the state side is to improve our businesses, improve job opportunities. Government doesn't create jobs. We create an environment for private enterprise to step in, thrive, and hire, and grow. And that's what we need to do, and that's what's gonna be facing us in the next session. We still have several down on the strip, casinos and their hotels that aren't up to full operation on the week. During the weekdays, they close down parts, floors of it, because they don't have the staff they also, to furnish, to take care of, of the uh, customers. They can't afford it. So we need to really get our economy back on a sound footing, get our conventions back, our tourism. We need to also look at di divesting and enlarging our state's economy. And some of that and most of that can be done by reducing some regulations and inviting various businesses in to come into Nevada and make Nevada the place where they do want to come to, conduct their business, raise their families. So it's really, when I say the economy, I'm talking in a micro sense of just Nevada, not in the macro of the inflations that we are limited in addressing. Um, but that's probably the number one issue. There's sub-issues too when you talk about education, which also is a one of the things used to attract businesses in. We need to provide a good educational system for them. We need to provide good health care, which I've worked on. But those are all minor and subordinate to the economy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate O'Neill. Candidate McDaniel, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. Candidate McDaniel, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I feel like my opponent may have looked at my <coughs> flash card up here um, because I, I agree with. Yes, yeah, see? It's, it's too I small can't for read him to that read small it. small of a writing. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I agree. The, the, the biggest fiscal challenge is the economy. And, and I do believe that, um, you know, a, a lot of it, like he said, it's, it's, we're experiencing this worldwide with, you know, inflation. Um, but we can work together on a state level to, to do some things in our state to help. We can look at reducing the barriers to entry to attract small businesses. Those are, that can be looking at you know, reducing the redundant permitting and possibly reducing some of those fees. Um, that is going to help increase jobs. We can also look at reforming some of the burdensome occupational laws. We can enter into an interstate license compact with nurses, that's, that's a big problem with health care, healthcare and, and we can attract that and, and make more jobs. Um, aside from job growth, helping grow the economy is looking at ways to increase affordable housing and, and help you know, with our education issues. Um, so those are some of my ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Candidate Noble, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I, I think I, I've got it. Um, I would just say that perhaps the biggest single issue for the individual in Nevada, and certainly in my neighborhood, is there's too much month left at the end of the money. And you can call that inflation, you can call that an economic problem, but it is true. People need, they need, um, the economy is an issue for them, gas prices, uh, food prices. I would, I actually, I think she must have looked at my uh, flashcards because I, I also want to say healthcare providers, I wouldn't limit it just to nurses. I'm a registered nurse, but I would tell you that that compact that 
that Shannon mentioned oh, wow. um, is a big deal, and we could bring a lot more nurses in if it was, was easier for them to get licensed. That should not necessarily be just focused on nursing. You could have um, uh, CT technicians, ultrasound technicians, radiology technicians. They can also be brought in. There's a huge demand for those kinds of um, personnel in our area. Uh, education, there's a shortage of teachers. We all know that. There's a shortage of mental health workers, not only for adults, but our children were in their homes for a year or more, and they did not have the socialization that they needed. They didn't have the teacher contact that they needed. We need to also balance development <coughs> with resources available. So comprehensive water plans, that reciprocity or licensing issues, um, increased pupil funding. Those, I think, are the biggest issues. Uh, Nevada has only, spends only about $10,000 per, per pupil. The rest of the country, on average, spends $15,000 per pupil. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Noble. Candidate O'Neill, at this time you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Thank you. You know, I'm really happy that my opponent brought up that both opponents were opponent and a half. <laughs> I'm not sure, nothing personal. <laughs> uh, brought up the nurses compact. In the last session, that was one of my bills. I was allowed to submit six bills. I submitted two bills dealing with mental or medical providers. One was the nurses compact for the state to join. There's 39 other states that are members of the nurses compact sitting on the hospital board, I know what we're paying traveling nurses at. It was not allowed to even have a hearing by the Democrats. Not allowed to have a hearing. The other one dealt with expansion of the dentists and what they could provide for services. Once again, not allowed to have a hearing. Physical therapist reciprocity not a, did not get out of the Senate. So yes, there is quite a bit and we have been trying to do it. Candidate O'Neill. Yes, ma'am, I'll up. shut up, thank you. Sorry, it's just an important issue. Uh, Sounds like we need more Democrats in the, in the uh, assembly. It was the Democrats that were taken. not allowed to have a hearing. Well, that's why I'm saying we probably now, need now. more. Well, <laughs> now, now, let's. Uh, <laughs> the next question is for Candidate Noble. What actions should the Nevada legislature take to help ensure Nevada has an adequate supply of safe and clean drinking water now and in the future? Thank you. Um, we need to have, well, let me start by saying that Nevada has been over allocated their water resources by somewhere between 100% and 300%. Uh, I, will, I will credit this information from Shannon because she's the one that has taught me a lot of information about water. It seems unfair that I get the question. But I will tell you that we need a comprehensive, we need to have a comprehensive water plan. We are not in huge trouble in Nevada. We're gonna get there if we don't have a comprehensive plan. And that means we need to be measuring our water yield, both the groundwater and surface water. We need to be incentivizing residents as well as farmers, ranchers, to conserve water. I'm not saying that we're gonna reduce or increase water prices, my, that's not my suggestion. My suggestion is to reward those people who use less water. We also need to have, um, in terms of water, we, we really need to have that that plan in place and look at how we are using our water. If you don't use it, you lose it. That may or may not be fair for ranchers, depending on what's going on. So I will leave it at that. Um, I think probably candidate McDaniel has a lot more to offer, um, and I plan to learn from her when I'm elected. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Noble. Candidate McDaniel, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. At this time, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, I, Dr. Noble, you give me too much credit, but thank you. Um, 
So like Dr. Noble said, we are in a use it or lose it, first in time, first in right state. Our law is based on a priority system. So if you want to use water in the state of Nevada, you have to have a permit through the Nevada Division of Water Resources because in Nevada, all of the water belongs to the public. So because we are in a first in time, first in right, more so use it or lose it state, conservation is not part of our water law. We all conserve individually, but because our water is, is administered, um, or rather appropriated, so handed out in a permitting system, there's two stages of this. You get your water rate right permit, and then you have to perfect that. You have to make it a certificate. While it's in this permitting stage, and even once it's a certificate, if you're not losing it, the state using it, the state can come in and take it from you. So if you're conserving, if you say, hey, state engineer, we're in a 20-year a, a drought. I, I want to conserve my water. He's, he can say, well, you're not using it, so I have to take it and either put it back into the system or put it to the next person in line. So we need to have conservation as part of our water law. We also need to give the state engineer a legislative framework for how to conjunctively manage our resource. So in the past, we've always looked at underground water separate from surface water. So your wells separate from the river. But that's not true. They are together, they're combined. So we need to give the state engineer a framework in which he can work in to be able to make decisions with that in mind. Right now, those decisions are being made in courts, and that's not where this should be made. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's what are we gonna do for water? You have two minutes. Right, thank you. And, you know, I think we're gonna actually find some agreement here, but I've gotta say this. In the last 10 years, uh, five sessions, legislative sessions, there have been some 55 odd bills submitted dealing with water rights, water usage, et cetera. 35 of those have been passed. I was just at a seminar with the mining, uh, Nevada Mining Association and spent a couple hours listening to the discussion on water rights. And one of the things that I heard was, yes, Nevada is probably held out across the country as having the gold standard of water rights and usage. Believe it or not, I've got to actually say something good about Las Vegas. They have tried to preserve their water and are doing well. I think one of the problems we have is a personal issue is, and I'll use Carson City as an example. Last night they talked about how we have 70, enough water for 75,000 people here in Carson City. I question that because as it grows, as in businesses come in, water's gonna be in more of a demand. We have to start thinking just because we had a good year two years ago, had two bad years, and we say, well, there's enough water for 75,000 population. We've gotta start thinking long term about really, let's always look at where we can go to re preserve water and what we can do to conserve that. And Carson City itself has some excellent water. You, they've redone their um, plant, so they're delivering good, healthy water to you. It gets tested. We're bar buying water from Douglas County to fulfill some of the needs here. So, but it is a collective statewide issue, and I think we do need to address it. It comes out of Natural Resources Committee. And as I said, we've been addressing it every session. Some of that, to me, we could improve by better management out of the water resources and the uh, state engineer could do a little better interpretation. Candidate O'Neill, your time is up. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Candidate McDaniel, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. <coughs> I, I get to rebut Dr. Noble. <laughs> Wouldn't that be I, I, st I started, but I... If, you, if, if, if I may, I'd like to make one more comment, even though I don't have anybody here to rebut. I I, may I do that? Do um, I have to do that? I think so. Yes, yes. I got permission. Okay. I just want to say um, I have a big concern about the fact that, have, have any of you heard of paper water? That wasn't mentioned, but paper water is selling the rights from one Minden, for example, and selling it to a developer in Dayton. That's paper water, that's not real water. 
And I just want to make a comment that that seems like something we shouldn't be doing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Candidate McDaniel, what measures should the Nevada legislature take to balance the economic rewards of mining for resources, such as lithium, with the potential adverse environmental impacts and disturbance of sacred lands of Nevada's indigenous citizens? And you have two minutes. Okay, thank you. So I am very much in favor of responsible mining. Mining is hugely important to the state. It's, it's what the state's built on. Um, with that being said, you know, we have a responsibility to tribal members and, and their sacred lands. Um, so how can we balance this? Um, so I think at the very, very least, we can improve communications. Um, if anybody is familiar with Thacker Pass, um, that's the lithium mine up, up in northern Nevada. Um, you, you know, they didn't, they didn't do a very good job at, at communicating to the tribe that, you know, they're going to be participating in, in this mining activity on these lands. The tribe didn't find out until a little bit later in the process, and then trying to find the information that was necessary for them to, you know, to, to consider was buried deep in the website. That, that's not acceptable. I mean, and that's, that's the very least we can do. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we are, we are taking care of of the mines, um, but you know, holding those bad actors accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, just I think I understand that I really do after her, but would you please? What measures should the Nevada legislature take to balance the economic rewards of mining for resources such as lithium? with the potential adverse environmental impacts and disturbance of sacred lands of Nevada's indigenous citizens. So you ask, hey, thank you. What, to me, the question is asking for more regulations on mining and requiring them to do something instead of learning from their mistakes in the past. And I don't think it's just lithium that we should really talk about, although that is with Thacker, another one of the mines. One of the mines that's, um, opening or planning on opening down in Yarrington for a copper mine, they've already looked for and hired representatives to work with the local tribes in uh, Shures, Yarrington Paiutes, and reach out even while they're still doing the planning stage. So it's a learning experience. I don't know if there should be a regulation to it, it's already re the Mining Association, when I was at their convention and we were talking about it, they've learned from their errors in the past. Um, I'd like to hear more from, as you say, from the tribes themselves. They're usually brought in to so much of that conversation now and are partaking in it. And even if you go out there to Fallon where they were going to do geothermal mining for electricity, for power, they got approval, but yet ORMAT stopped, stopped their operation to work further with the Fallon Paiutes on uh, developing a better resources and cooperative effort together. So I think mines are, and I say mines, all the mines. It's just not minerals. It's all the mining that's being done is going there. I don't think the legislation is necessary, and we should just observe and uh, support. Thank you, Candidate O'Neill. Candidate Noble, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I have it. Thank you. Um, I would just say that uh, we need protection for the community that the mining is being done, and we need to monitor. I think what has been said is certainly right on point. I would just say that 
the balance between what the economy in Nevada can gain versus what damage we might do to the, the environment are things we need to look at. Um, in addition, I, I agree that we need to have better communication with particularly indigenous uh, land owners, and um, that needs to be done up front as these things are being planned. I would also say that I'm aware that in Silver Springs there was a mine, there is a mine that has been um, worked. And the community, as I understand it, is very disappointed because promises were made and they were not kept. So I think I would agree we have to learn from past mistakes and I think we need to responsibly mine to help our economy and balance that with protections and communication with the communities in which those mines are going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Noble. Candidate McDaniel? You have 30 seconds to rebut. Um, I, I, I just wanna agree with Dr. Noble that those communications should be done up front and, and, and they should be brought in, in in the beginning. So, thank you. Candidate O'Neill, what changes would you recommend for improving K through 12 education? Thank you. Well, I strongly believe in parental involvement and parental choice. We need to get parents back into the education. I think they've given away too much to educate to the school systems. The public school system is becoming the parent and loca. Uh, they need to get back involved. I think we should look at savings accounts. I think we need to let the parents choose. I think we need to let public schools get a little more um, incentive to deliver or how they deliver their education and get a little more um, responsive to the parents' needs on their students' education. It's, it truly is not one size fits all children, but they need to get a little competitive. So we can do that with some of the educational savings accounts and let the parents choose where the school wants to, where they want their child to go to. And if you want to address, well, that can overcrowd one school, you can limit the size so it does become first choice. You've got to get in there, but you've got to do away to me with requiring the parent, if they want to go to one school instead of this other school, that they have to give up reasons and get permission from the school board to do that. I, <clears throat> I don't believe that money alone is a solution. We've been giving money to the education system for years now, and I really haven't seen changes to our educational delivery. So we've got to start looking at other states where they've been successful and start incorporating that some here in Nevada. So that's what we've got to do is just be more innovative, support our teachers. I feel sorry for the teachers right now and all the requirements that they have to do and what they have to put up with. I hear it regularly, how they're assaulted. I was talking to a teacher yesterday. She was saying her first grade classroom gets destroyed and she has to get all the other students out instead of handling that one disruptive student. So we've got to start there too and support them. So we just got to get Candidate more innovative. O'Neill, thank you. your time is up, thank you. Candidate Noble, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I have it. Um, Yes, actually, would you repeat the question? Thank you. Thank you. What changes would you recommend for improving K through 12 education? That's it, okay. Um, I would disagree that teachers don't need a pay raise. They, they do a yeoman's job. I believe that teachers are um, underpaid and underappreciated, first of all. They also, and if you know a teacher, you know that they take money out of their own pocket to get resources for their children um, to learn uh, different experiments. I also believe that we need to provide more mental health support counselors for the children and the teachers in schools to avoid the kinds of things that um, were just discussed mental health resources. Our children, as I mentioned earlier, were out of school a year or more and suffered depression. They need mental health services. 
as well as some of our adults, of course. Um, I believe there should be no diversion of funds to private schools. That does not mean that charter schools or magnet schools should, be, should not be publicly supported. But I do believe that it's a parent's choice if they want to send their children to private school or homeschool them. I talked to a teacher over the weekend who told me flat out she quit along with 50%, she said, of other, other teachers that she worked with. Her best story was she was teaching her children in home ec to make turkey burgers. That teacher was called on the carpet for teaching vegan issues, which if you know about turkey, it's not vegan. <laughs> So I'll just say, um, teachers are under attack and they need support, and I support them. Thank you, Candidate Noble. Candidate McDaniel, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you. So the legislature has continued to add more and more requirements on our teachers, on our, on our public schools, but yet they have not um, can I can I mention that the timer is not? Don't tell that. <laughs> Sorry, um, but they've yet to fund what it takes to meet those requirements. So we need to find ways to increase funding to achieve smaller class sizes and increase um, teacher and faculty pay, and not supplant that funding when we find funding for it. We should look at. Also, reevaluating the per pupil funding formula. I think that teachers are spending more and more time administering performance tests, data collecting, and recording and reporting that data, and less time teaching our kids. We need to evaluate what's actually needed to give teachers more time to be in the classroom teaching our kids. I believe that um, if, if we talk about competition, if, if we take the funding away from the public schools, you know, they're obligated to teach every student. They can't be selective, so they cannot be competitive. And I think we should have a mental health professional, not a counselor, not a social worker, somebody trained to deal with mental health crises in each high school and each middle school. And if we, don't, if we can't fund that, then I believe we should be working with the schools to adopt programs like the wraparound program at Pioneer High School, where the school um, is connected with those services to help these students. They're connected with the police officers who are important in this, the support that they provide with the crisis centers. And you know they bring these services to the student. Thank you. Thank you. As of this time, we'll move forward with audience submitted question. Wait, uh, do we have a rebuttal? Oh, thank you. So sorry. Thank you. I'll make it really quick. Okay. Three points, very fast. Thank you. I never said don't give a teacher a raise. They, they need the raises just like all other employees right now in this economy could use raises. But let me give you two examples. The state has regularly, we gave money in 2009 to Las Vegas to reduce class size. They came back in 2015, asked for more money to reduce class size. The question was, what did you do with the money? We don't know, but we need more money. Give it to us. We don't know what we did with it. That's why we've asked for an audit of the Clark County School District. Second, we provided Candidate. teachers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, as of this time, we'll move forward with audience submitted questions. Candidate Noble, do you think Nevada's legislature should have annual sessions? Wow. Um, you know, I, I believe we could get a lot more done in this state if we had more than 120 days of session every other year. I don't honestly know of another state that has such a short and limited time to get the job done. And I will tell you that my experience um, through grassroots lobby days 
and following the legislature, there's an awful lot that gets, gets done at the beginning, but it, is, it just is a race the last two to three weeks of the session to get as much done as possible. And I would question how much is, is focused during that time. So I think we should look at having a longer session every year, whether it's 220 days, but certainly we should be meeting every year. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate McDaniel, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, part of what the legislature does is, is to approve the budget, and these budgets are done biannually. Bi biannually? Um, and anyhow, you know, that second year, things can change a lot. I mean, we're experiencing that now, right? So, so in the second year, is it going to be funded? You know, that, that's a, a big question. Will these agencies have enough money to provide the services for Nevadans in that second year? So if we go to, to change our system and meet every year, you know, that could help this. And like Dr. Noble said, you know, we have 120 days to get things done. And we are rushing at the end. And I, I say we like I've done this before, but I haven't. But I've been part of it on the agency side. And, you know, it's, it's tough. Bills, important bills aren't considered because you're, there's just not time to consider everything. So um, I, I guess I would be in favor of moving toward um, annual sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? No, ma'am, I've got this one, Dan. I just want Ken's two minutes. <clears throat> I'm going to say first, no. We're a citizen legislature. If we went to annual sessions, also the 120 days is set in law. It's set within our Constitution. We had a ballot initiative several years ago that established that. So we're a citizen legislature. If we went to full-time or every year, whether it's some states do it 60 one year uh, and then 90 next year, they'll do legislation regulations this year, the next year would be the budget. Regulations and budget are very interactive and intertwined with one another on what you can do. So I say no, we're there. What we really should do is, is start demanding our legislature to work on Friday afternoons and Saturdays because those are counting as 120 days. And the first couple months, because I've been there, Friday afternoons and Saturdays, well, Friday afternoons, hardly anybody's there. Saturday, nobody's there, including me, because I get, I'd be lonely. So, you know, I really say, and this is, my fellow legislators are probably gonna hate me, especially those from Vegas, but you're there to work. You got 120 days, get the job done. And that's why at the end of the session, we cram and we have to suspend the rules. And to me, it's not fair to you as citizens. It's not fair to us. And that's where some bad legislation slides through and happens. So, and there, there are other larger states that actually, Texas is one that has a biennial session and it works. So we stay the way we are. We're citizen legislature, we're proud of that. That allows people from working areas that are still working and employed with families, with jobs, to come and represent you. And that's what we've got to keep doing, is have the citizens be there in the legislature. But to me, hold me to task. Hold us all to task to work for you. Thank you. Candidate Noble, you have 30 seconds. Oh, um, I would just say that uh, one thing I didn't say and many of you know this already, that what happens with, uh, after the th session is over, they take a break, and the Assembly and Senate people do actually have committee work, and they develop ideas for new bills for the next session. I still believe 
that 120 days, even if it's Saturday and Sunday, it's not enough time to give the really good bills that need to be passed a due process. If they go to a committee and they don't get a hearing, they're dead. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate McDaniel, who are the top three contributors financially to your campaign? I now have to think. Um, I I'm, haven't prepared my C&E for this round yet. Um, gosh, I think that the Carson City Dems, um, can I ask, does this include in-kind contributions? There is no specificity. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do in-kind contributions to the Nevada State Democratic Party and, um, gosh, I think that, that um, I apologize. I should have looked this up before I came. Um, and one more, huh? Let's see. I, I received a donation from the CWA um, Political Action Fund, I think that's what they are, and that was in the amount of $500, so. I, and I apologize if that's incorrect, and I will happy to, be happy to fact check myself after this. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Man. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I'm glad she got it first. <laughs> Gave me more time to think, because know, I'll be geez. honest, um, keep thinking. I am. <clears throat> uh, yeah, a lot of my contributions have come, I'm going to say, from John Q. Citizen. That's really, I, I don't mean to, why money has been tight this session or this election cycle. Um, I do know, so John Q. Citizen adds up to probably the largest contributor of mine. You would look at them collectively. The Realtors Association is supportive. And that's two, three. Mm -hmm. I got to say, well, it gets back to friends and John Q. Um, Uh, how did you came up with that? Yeah. That's a tough question. Which one of you guys out there? <laughs> it's an audience question. Yeah. <laughs> they want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Normally, you know, I, I can say normally in a normal session, we, we, the support across the board comes from large organizations and businesses. This cycle, it has not come from a lot of those large organizations um, because they are just recovering, still recovering from the shutdown of, of the uh, COVID, um, and I'm really trying to stretch my mind. John Q, um, I guess I'll go, I'll go with um, Casino Fandango has been very supportive. So maybe that's the three. I'll say John Q Citizen, the Realtors uh, Association or their PAC, and um, Fandango, and like, if I'm wrong, yeah. I apologize. I did not mean it. I, uh, and you know, that's the good part is none of us really know. So you can't say that any of us are being bought or paid for at all because we don't know. So that's Thank the good you. side. Thank you so Sorry. much, Candidate O'Neill. Candidate Noble, yeah. would you like me to repeat the question? No, I've got this one. Oh, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really do. I have to tell you that I have not paid anyone in my campaign. I have 
13 wonderfully brilliant women who have volunteered their time to make my campaign what it is, and I want to publicly thank those that are here tonight. Uh, as far as donors, um, I have some John Q. Public women or men that are regular donors every month through Act Blue. Um, that probably totals somewhere around $1,000. I have one other woman uh, that has donated uh, $500. The rest of our campaign money has come from small donors um, and in kind. I have not taken any money from any unions or businesses or any, um, any commercial property or retailers. It is all private citizens and people who have chosen to work on my campaign in kind um, to make what we have done in the last six months a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Noble. So we're approaching our can, time. Can I have a 30 second rebuttal? Oh, yes. <laughs> I uh, am fact-checking myself, and I uh, just remembered that uh, the Progressive Turnout Project did an in-kind donation for me, too. And uh, I want to say thank you to all of my supporters, um, because I couldn't be here and do this without them and without you. Some of them are in the crowd, so thank you guys so much. May I thank also you. do one little... I, I just want to shout out to those... Um, out. to Douglas County Dems... Yeah. DCDW, Douglas County Democratic Women, and Lyon County Democrats who supported my campaign. Thank you. Thank you. So we are approaching our time limit, but I would like to know how many uh, more questions do you have time to answer? How many more are there? I would <laughs> there are quite a few. Pick two. I mean, that. What do you want to do? Are you done? Are you both done? I want dinner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm just ready. Fine. Okay, just two out of three say we're done. Seeing these again. <laughs> what was the decision that was made? Two out of three say we're done. No, oh. I said oh. two's yeah. fine. I don't care. So we will proceed with two more audience submitted questions. We're going to arm wrestle. Then we will close for <laughs> closing remarks. Candidate O'Neill. What will you do to address the lack of child care? You know, child care is a lot like several other things going on right now. It's economy driven. We've got to get people back to work. We've got to get people back in there so they need child care, want child care, and are willing to pay for child care. They get deductions on their income taxes as it stands now. It's a deduction for them. So there's an incentive on it too. But we need to get people back to work. And that's the big question right now is how do we get people back to work? We need to do that. So many things were shut down during the pandemic that um, we've lost it. Uh, and to me, one of the things right now, because there's a huge demand on em for employment, for employees. And so I offer this to any businesses out there as an incentive. You know, they're offering $15 an hour right now starting wage at um, In-N-Out, because I was just there the other day for a milkshake. Oh, my wife's too, here too. I snitched myself off. But um, <clears throat> one of the things, and the state even talked about this several years ago, to provide an incentive to provide health care, or I mean, I'm sorry, um, Child care, as an incentive, you come to work for the state, we would have child care facilities. Um, WNC has that up there now. They have a child care facility there at WNC for them. So there's an added bonus in what could be done by employers to attract employees to come work for me. I may not pay the full 15 20 $50 an hour, but I'll pay you 45 plus give you child care. It's just one of the other opportunities out there. And I think it's really part driven by the economy and by private enterprise. If there is a need, this country, when there's been a need, private enterprise has stepped forward and pretty much fulfilled that need and we've been successful over the years with it. Thank you, Candidate O'Neill. 
Candidate Noble, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. I, I would um, tell you there, there are two or three things that I would want to have happen. I will just start with a little story. We have some friends that had twins that are about two years old now, and they pay $3,500 a month for those two children to be in, in daycare, childcare. Uh, that's a lot of money, and I think most people who have their first child don't realize how much that's gonna cost to put them in daycare. I would also say that I'm aware that a lot of women have left the workforce, as you indicated, people, um, they've left the workforce because it, they can't afford to put their children in daycare and go to work. They'd rather, it's, it's less expensive for them to stay home and take care of their children. Women are out of the workforce, and that's unfortunate since the pandemic. We need to increase the, we need to provide a living wage for those childcare workers so they will stay doing the job that they're trained to do. And in addition, there are resources available and Governor Sisolak has provided, I, I want to say $170 million, I might be off on that amount, for expanding child care services, the hours that, they're, that the services are open, to make sure that if a, if a person has to leave their children there all day and, or work a, a different shift, what do they do with the child if they work from 4 to midnight? So expanding those services is, is very important. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Candidate Noble. Candidate McDaniel, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you. So I will say that I agree with um, my opponent and, and Dr. Noble together, which might be kind of weird, but, I, you know, I... I, I do think that we can partner, you know, be a partner with businesses and, and provide incentives, but, you know, if the businesses provide that on their own, that's great, and we should be encouraging that, too. Um, but, but what I want to add to this is that, you know, Dr. Noble talked about, you know, women quitting the workforce, but I think one of, a prob one of the areas that's overlooked is um, women who have been convicted of crimes that that go into to prison or jail and serve their time, when they come out, they're not eligible for children's cabinet any longer. And I don't think that that's acceptable. You know, we're trying to, to reintegrate these women back into society. They're trying to become productive members of society, but they, they can't even get this, you know, this very basic program to help them get back on their feet. So I think that we should remove those barriers from you know those types of programs to help these women out. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Can I? Candidate O'Neill. Thank you. Very quickly. First of all, I disagree with Cicel Governor Sisolak giving money because in two years that money's going to run out, and people will still expect it. So now it'll be the state's responsibility to raise your taxes to pay for this. Second of all, it's just not women that stay home and take care of their children. I was a single parent, had custody of my three children. I worked and took care of my three children also. So it isn't just women. I'm sort of disappointed to hear that from women, only thinking that women can take care of children. Uh, and as to living wages, that's once again economy driven. Ken, and yes. Thank you so much. Candidate Noble, will you submit a bill draft request to repeal the commerce tax slash margins tax? That's the C tax? No. Yes. Oh, um, I'm afraid I will not be able to answer that question because I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Candidate McDaniel? Would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I don't think, sitting here right now with the question posed as it is, that I would 
um, put a bill in to repeal it. I also am not 100% familiar with it, so before I could give a more concrete answer, I would certainly have to look further into it. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Candidate O'Neill, would you like me to repeat the question? No, ma'am. Thank you, though. The last economic forum, which meets to do the projections on where the state's budget is projected, close to a $700 million surplus coming out of this biennium. So what I think is actually what we should do is not just look at one tax specifically on removing, is we should review where our expenditures are and look at what we can reduce across the board on taxes to alleviate that will also drive and stimulate the economy itself. So, and unfortunately my BDRs are already called for anyways, but I would, I'd love to have the conversation. It's very difficult to talk about one specific tax on there when you're talking about that size of a budget surplus. So we need to address it. I think it can be uh, addressed, though, and looked at along with other taxes. Thank you. Candidate Noble, you have 30 seconds. I think what I would want to add is that I, have, I know a lot of smart people, and I would want to do, as uh, Shannon has talked about, is do my research and understand it better, um, and then make a decision as to whether I wanted to um, submit a BDR. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we'll have closing remarks. Candidate McDaniel, you have one minute. Thank you again, League of Women Voters, Sierra Nevada Forums, and the AAUW. Thank you, audience members, for being here. Thank you, BAC, for um, letting us use your facility. And thank you to uh, my fellow candidates up here. Um, as an engineer, we were not gifted with the ability of successful public speaking. So yes, if you're wondering, this is my literal nightmare. But, you know, I, I, I want to say, you know, I've, I've put in the time, I've done my homework, I've, I've put in the work, um, and I, I can't promise you that I have all of the answers today. But what I can promise is that I will work hard with my fellow legislators to come up with those answers. I bring a background we don't have in the le legislature, a background in resources. So please visit my website, shannon4nv.com, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, the number four, nv.com, and please reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate McDaniel. Candidate O'Neill, you have one minute for your closing remark. Thank you. Again, I want to thank Ms. Scott, the League of Women Voters, and all of you tonight for being here. And as it said, the other two candidates, you've had some great questions. The audience has had great questions. I think you've heard some differences of opinions. I think it identifies some of our different philosophies and what we can deliver to you and to our state as a whole. I will say this, together, working together, all of us, we can work for a better tomorrow in our state. We can make things better. We can make Nevada back to where it should be, the state that we are so proud of the place where you want to conduct business, you want to raise your family with good education, safe communities, and a wonderful place to live and enjoy the beauty of this state. I'm P.K. O'Neill. I would greatly appreciate your support. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And your vote in helping me return to represent you in the legislature once again. Thank you very, very much for tonight. Thank you. Candidate Noble, you have one minute for your closing remarks. Thank you. At the beginning of this session, I stated my belief that every one of you wants honest, honesty, integrity, and transparency in your elected officials. These are core values to me. Other core values for me are har working hard and making positive contributions to any organization where I have worked. Running in this race is not about ego gratification or garnering another position. It is about a commitment to work hard, making a contribution, 
and improving the lives of people in my community. I thank you for your time and your attention. And I thank the League of Women Voters, Sierra Nevada Forums, as well as AAUW. Please visit my website or, or Facebook page for more information or if you'd like to have some questions. It's Dr. No JaniceNoble.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, candidates. See you, Liv. Thank you once again to the audience. We do have one more moderator for, excuse me, forum session next week, Monday. Again, thank you so much to the candidates. There's a schedule as you can see. I would also like to thank all, all of the volunteers, LWV members, AAUW, Sierra Nevada Forums, as well as high school students from Carson High School. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you.